Maine. Chapter 40 Overdue still continued to lie forgotten on the table. Every manuscript that he had had out now lay under the table. Only one manuscript he kept going, and that was Brissenden's ephemera. His bicycle and black suit were again in pawn, and the typewriter people were once more worrying about the rent. But such things no longer bothered him. He was seeking a new orientation, and until that was found, his life must stand still. After several weeks, what he had been waiting for happened. He met Ruth on the street. It was true she was accompanied by her brother, Norman, and it was true that they tried to ignore him, and that Norman attempted to wave him aside. "'If you interfere with my sister, I'll call an officer,' Norman threatened. "'She does not wish to speak with you, and your insistence is insult. "'If you persist, you'll have to call that officer, "'and then you'll get your name in the papers,' Martin answered grimly. "'And now, get out of my way and get the officer if you want to. "'I'm going to talk with Ruth.' I want to have it from your own lips, he said to her. She was pale and trembling, but she held up and looked inquiringly. The question I asked in my letter, he prompted. Norman made an impatient movement, but Martin checked him with a swift look. She shook her head. Is all this of your own free will, he demanded. It is... She spoke in a low, firm voice and with deliberation. It is of my own free will. You have disgraced me so that I am ashamed to meet my friends. They are all talking about me, I know. That is all I can tell you. You have made me very unhappy, and I never wish to see you again. Friends, gossip, newspaper, misreports. Surely such things are not stronger than love. I can only believe that you never loved me. A blush drove the pallor from her face. "'After what has passed,' she said faintly, "'Martin, do you not know what you are saying? I am not common.' "'You see, she doesn't want to have anything to do with you,' Norman blurted out, starting on with her. Martin stood aside and let them pass, fumbling unconsciously in his coat pocket for the tobacco and brown papers that were not there. It was a long walk to North Oakland, but it was not until he went up the steps and entered his room that he knew he had walked it. He found himself sitting on the edge of the bed and staring about him like an awakened somnambulist. He noticed Overdue lying on the table and drew up his chair and reached for his pen. There was in his nature a logical compulsion toward completeness. Here was something undone. It had been deferred against the completion of something else. Now that something else had been finished, and he would apply himself to his task until it was finished. What he would do next he did not know. All that he did know was that a climacteric in his life had been attained. A period had been reached, and he was rounding it off in a workmanlike fashion. He was not curious about the future. He would soon enough find out what it held in store for him. Whatever it was, it did not matter. Nothing seemed to matter. For five days he toiled on at overdue, going nowhere, seeing nobody, and eating meagerly. On the morning of the sixth day, the postman brought him a thin letter from the editor of the Parthenon. A glance told him that ephemera was accepted. We have submitted the poem to Mr. Cartwright Bruce. The editor went on to say, and he is reported so favorably upon it that we cannot let it go. As an earnest of our pleasure in publishing the poem, let me tell you that we have set it for the August number, our July number being already made up. Kindly extend our pleasure and our thanks to Mr. Brissenden. Please send by return mail his photograph and biographical data. If our honorarium is unsatisfactory... Kindly telegraph us at once and state what you consider a fair price. Since the honorarium that had been offered was $350, Martin thought it not worthwhile to telegraph. Then, too, there was Brissenden's consent to be gained. Well, he had been right after all. Here was one magazine editor who knew real poetry when he saw it. 
and the price was splendid, even though it was for the poem of a century. As for Cartwright Bruce, Martin knew that he was the one critic for whose opinions Brissenden had any respect. Martin rode downtown on an electric car, and as he watched the houses and cross streets slipping by, he was aware of a regret that he was not more elated over his friend's success and over his own signal victory. The one critic in the United States had pronounced favorably on the poem, while his own contention that good stuff could find its way into the magazines had proved correct. But enthusiasm had lost its spring in him, and he found that he was more anxious to see Brissenden than he was to carry the good news. The acceptance of the Parthenon had recalled to him that during his five days' devotion to Overdue, he had not heard from Brissenden, nor even thought about him. For the first time, Martin realized the days he had been in, and he felt shame for having forgotten his friend. But even the shame did not burn very sharply. He was numb to emotions of any sort, save the artistic ones concerned in the writing of Overdue. So far as other affairs were concerned, he had been in a trance. For that matter, he was still in a trance. All this life through which the electric car whirred seemed remote and unreal, and he would have experienced little interest and less shock if the great stone steeple of the church he passed had suddenly crumbled to mortar dust upon his head. At the hotel he hurried up to Brissenden's room and hurried down again. The room was empty. All luggage was gone. Did Mr. Brissenden leave any address? He asked the clerk, who looked at him curiously for a moment. "'Haven't you heard?' he asked. Martin shook his head. "'Why, the papers were full of it. He was found dead in bed, suicide, shot himself through the head. "'Is he buried yet?' Martin seemed to hear his voice, like someone else's voice, from a long way off, asking the question. "'No, the body was shipped east after the inquest.' Lawyers engaged by his people saw to the arrangements. They were quick about it, I must say, Martin commented. Oh, I don't know. It happened five days ago. Five days ago? Yes, five days ago. Oh, Martin said as he turned and went out. At the corner, he stepped into the Western Union and sent a telegram to the Parthenon, advising them to proceed with the publication of the poem. He had in his pocket but five cents with which to pay his car fare home, so he sent the message collect. Once in his room, he resumed his writing. The days and nights came and went, and he sat at his table and wrote on. He went nowhere, save to the pawnbroker, took no exercise, and ate methodically when he was hungry and had something to cook, and just as methodically went without when he had nothing to cook. Composed as the story was in advance, chapter by chapter, he nevertheless saw and developed an opening that increased the power of it, though it necessitated twenty thousand additional words. It was not that there was any vital need that the thing should be well done, but that his artistic canons compelled him to do it well. He worked on in the days, strangely detached from the world around him, feeling like a familiar ghost among these literary trappings of his former life. He remembered that someone had said that a ghost was the spirit of a man who was dead, and who did not have sense enough to know it. And he paused for a moment to wonder if he were really dead and unaware of it. Came the day when Overdue was finished. The agent of the typewriter firm had come for the machine, and he sat on the bed while Martin, on the one chair, typed the last pages of the final chapter. Fini, he wrote, in capitals at the end. And to him, it was indeed Fini. He watched the typewriter carried out the door with a feeling of relief, and went over and lay down on the bed. He was faint from hunger. Food had not passed his lips in thirty-six hours, but he did not think about it. He lay on his back with closed eyes, and did not think at all, while the days or stupor slowly welled up, saturating his consciousness. 
Half in delirium, he began muttering aloud the lines of an anonymous poem Brissenden had been fond of quoting to him. Maria, listening anxiously outside his door, was perturbed by his monotonous utterance. The words in themselves were not significant to her, but the fact that he was saying them was, I have done, was the burden of the poem. I have done, put by the lute. Song and singing soon are over, as the airy shades that hover in among the purple clover. I have done, put by the lute. Once I sang as early thrushes, sing among the dewy bushes. Now I'm mute. I am like a weary linnet, for my throat has no song in it. I have had my singing minute. I have done, put by the lute. Maria could stand it no longer, and hurried away to the stove, where she filled a quart bowl with soup, putting into it the lion's share of chopped meat and vegetables, which her ladle scraped from the bottom of the pot. Martin roused himself and sat up and began to eat, between spoonfuls reassuring Maria that he had not been talking in his sleep, and that he did not have any fever. After she left him, he sat drearily, with drooping shoulders, on the edge of the bed, gazing about him with lackluster eyes that saw nothing until the torn wrapper of a magazine, which had come in the morning's mail and which lay unopened, shot a gleam of light into his darkened brain. It was the Parthenon, he thought, the August Parthenon, and it must contain ephemera, if only Brissenden were here to see— he was turning the pages of the magazine, when suddenly he stopped. Ephemera had been featured, with gorgeous headpiece and beardsley-like margin decorations. On the side of the headpiece was Brissenden's photograph. On the other side was a photograph of Sir John Value, the British ambassador. A preliminary editorial note quoted Sir John Value as saying that there were no poets in America and the publication of Ephemera was the Parthenon's, There, take that, Sir John Value. Cartwright Bruce was described as the greatest critic in America, and he was quoted as saying that Ephemera was the greatest poem ever written in America. And finally, the editor's foreword ended with, We have not yet made up our minds entirely as to the merits of Ephemera. Perhaps we shall never be able to do so. But we have read it often, wondering at the words in their arrangement, wondering where Mr. Brissenden got them, and how he could fasten them together. Then followed the poem, Pretty good thing you died, Briss, old man, Martin murmured, letting the magazine slip between his knees to the floor. The cheapness and vulgarity of it was nauseating, and Martin noted apathetically that he was not nauseated very much. He wished he could get angry, but did not have energy enough to try. He was too numb. His blood was too congealed to accelerate to the swift tidal flow of indignation. After all, what did it matter? It was on a par with all the rest that Brissenden had condemned in bourgeois society. Poor Briss, Martin communed. He would never have forgiven me. Rousing himself with an effort, he possessed himself of a box, which had once contained typewriter paper. Going through its contents, he drew forth eleven poems which his friend had written. These he tore lengthwise and crosswise, and dropped into the waste basket. He did it languidly, and, when he had finished, sat on the edge of the bed, staring blankly before him. How long he sat there, he did not know, until, suddenly... Across his sightless vision, he saw form a long horizontal line of white. It was curious. But as he watched it grow in definiteness, he saw that it was a coral reef, smoking in the white Pacific surges. Next, in the line of breakers, he made out a small canoe, an outrigger canoe. In the stern he saw a young bronzed god in scarlet hip cloth, dipping a flashing paddle. He recognized him. He was Moti, the youngest son of Tati, the chief. And this was Tahiti, and beyond that smoking reef lay the sweet land of Papara, 
and the chief's grass house by the river's mouth. It was the end of the day, and Moti was coming home from fishing. He was waiting for the rush of a big breaker whereon to jump the reef. Then he saw himself sitting forward in the canoe, as he had often sat in the past, dipping a paddle that waited Moti's word to dig in like mad when the turquoise wall of the great breaker rose behind them. Next, he was no longer an onlooker, but was himself in the canoe. Moti was crying out, and they were both thrusting hard with their paddles, racing on the steep face of the flying turquoise. Under the bow the water was hissing, as from a steam jet. The air was filled with driven spray. There was a rush and rumble and long echoing roar, and the canoe floated on the placid water of the lagoon. Moti laughed and shook the salt water from his eyes, and together they paddled into the pounded coral beach, where Tati's grass walls through the coconut palms showed golden in the setting sun. The picture faded, and before his eyes stretched the disorder of his squalid room. He strove in vain to see Tahiti again. He knew there was singing among the trees, and that the maidens were dancing in the moonlight, but he could not see them. He could see only the littered writing table, the empty space where the typewriter had stood, and the unwashed window pane. He closed his eyes with a groan and slept. End of chapter 40